now that you know how to calculate stock returns uh, and you know the limitations of it in terms of its uh, randomness, we can try and improve our analysis just a little bit by learning how to estimate the expected return using the mean or average method. Just a quick recap though, remember that uh, we said we calculate the returns by PT uh, over PT minus one minus one, and you can do this on Excel as well as on Google Sheets. We saw that when we plotted out the returns, it was totally random. And you know, I'd actually encourage you to try plotting out the returns for other stocks. So you can see that this uh, pattern is quite persistent and it's quite apparent for uh, any and every stock. Okay, so we know how to calculate returns. When it comes to the expected returns then, the simplest estimate is uh, indeed the stock's average historic return, i.e. the mean return. So let's go ahead and calculate this manually first so you really understand the process, and then we can look at uh, doing this even more easily uh, on Excel or Google Sheets. So say for instance, you pulled uh, a little bit of stock price data. So I've got uh, six days of uh, price data for Facebook here. Um, what we wanna do to get the expected returns is to start by calculating returns. Remember that we said the return is simply PT plus one over PT minus one. And so you would take $184.67 here, divided by 181.42, and subtract one to get this long and painful number here, 0.01791432. And then you would take $184.33, divide that by 184.67 uh, minus one to get this long number here, and so on and so forth for each one until the last one. Importantly, it's really tempting to round off these numbers I would strongly encourage you not to round them off. I mean, these are already quite distorted and by rounding off the numbers at this stage, we're distorting them even further. So I would wait to round off uh, numbers until you get to the final answer. So we would um, get the returns as they are and then all we need to do is take the mean. So in this case, we have five observations, add all of the individual returns that we have and divide it by five. Why do we have five? Remember we started with six observations for price, but given that return is PT plus one over PT, well, in this observation here, we don't have a prior price. So essentially this is only good to calculate the return for the following day. And so you'll always end up losing uh, one observation uh, when you're calculating uh, returns. So we have five sets of returns uh, data, add all of them up, divide it by five, and you've got, um, your answer for the expected return, which you'll find is approximately equal to 0.70%. So this would be our estimate for Facebook's expected return. Um, it looks deceptively small, but we're gonna to touch on that in just a bit. Let's just make sure that we understand the formula first. So the expected return on any stock J when using the mean method is this beauty here. And if this is freaking you out right now, please don't let it freak you out. Uh, it's actually quite straightforward. This thing here that looks like a very funky E is what we call the sigma summation operator. And all it's doing is it's adding whatever is in front of it. So in this case, we've got the sigma summation operator for RJ. RJ is the return on a stock J. And so we're adding the return on stock J, starting from the point where T is equal to one, and then going all the way and up to and including the end observation. So in our example just over here, t equals to one was this observation right here, and t equals to five is this observation here. So we're adding all of these returns one by one, right? So we add all of the returns, and then we multiply it by one divided by n, which is the same as dividing it by n. So that essentially is taking the average. So if we were to open this equation up, for instance, what you'd find is that it would look like this, right? So expected return on a stock J is equal to one over N multiplied by RJ1 plus RJ2 plus RJ3 and so on and so forth until you get to the final observation. So the nth return of stock J. And multiplying this by one divided by N is the same as just dividing it by N and that's because anything multiplied by one is indeed itself. So this equation right here is the same as this equation right here, and this is our uh, sort of opened up version uh, of the expected return calculated using means. 
Now we can do exactly the same thing on Google Sheets or Excel. So here's the Google Sheets uh, spreadsheet that we were working with before. All we need to do is to say that the expected return, um, you know, that's just for notations. So to calculate the expected returns, literally just take the average, select your data, um, and you're good to go. So that right there is the expected return. If you want, you can sort of convert that into a percentage. And then you can see that uh, this is 0.13%. Notice that here we're talking about five to six years worth of data, uh, whereas when we did it manually, we only had five observations. So in this case, the number of observations uh, that we're dealing with is, um, I think it should be in the thousands. So there you go, 1,414 observations compared to uh, when we just had five observations, we saw that the expected return was not 0.7%. As with most things, the law of large numbers uh, holds. And so I would rely on this figure uh, much more than this figure right here um, as an estimate for the expected return. And last but not least, of course, you can do exactly the same thing on Excel as well. It's the same function, the same average function. Um, select your data and you've got the same results, right? So 0.13% is the expected return for Facebook. All right, so we know how to estimate the expected return, but how do we interpret this uh, expected return? So what we're saying is, if you were to invest in Facebook, um, you could expect to earn 0.13% every day. Right? This is our expectation, this is our prediction, if you like. How good is our expectation? Let's plot out uh, the expected return. Clearly, this is not great, right? Because what we're saying is, we expect to earn 0.13%, but indeed there are days where we earn as high as sort of 30%, other days where we lose as much as sort of 12.5%. Uh, and so the returns that's being realized by investing in Facebook is nowhere near the expectation of 0.13%. Having said that, as crude as the estimate looks, its simplicity really does cut it some slack. More importantly though, remember that the 0.13% uh, expected return that we saw represents the daily expected return. If you're a more longer term investor, then you're probably more interested in, or should be interested in, things like the annual expected return. And what we can do is to annualize this uh, expected return. And we can do this using two different methods, one of which is more crude than the other, so the easiest way to do it is to simply multiply the daily expected return by 250, and that's your estimate for the annual expected return. So that's your annualized expected return. Why do we multiply it by 250 and not 365? Because there's approximately 250 trading days in a year. Remember that markets are closed on weekends, and they're also closed on public holidays. So on average, you'll find that trading days pretty much across the globe is about 250. The other way you can annualize the expected return is slightly more sophisticated and it incorporates the effects of compounding. So you can compound the daily expected return over 250 days. Let's take a look at what this looks like with our uh, Facebook example. So with the crude method, you would literally take the daily expected return of 0.13% and multiply that by 250 days to end up with an annualized expected return of 32.5%. Right, so what this is saying is that if we were to invest in Facebook, on average, we expect to earn 32.5%. We expect to make 32.5% return. With the sophisticated uh, method, you would take one plus the daily return, so 0.13%, and raise it to the power of 250 uh, trading days, and then subtract one to end up with 38.37%. Now, the reason this formula works the way it does is because of the time value of money, which is, in a nutshell, just means that money loses value over time, and so we need to incorporate the effects of that time value of money uh, when we're annualizing um, returns or expected returns. So maybe when you first saw the expected return of 0.13%, you were thinking that's ridiculously low. It can't be real. I mean, not for Facebook and not for most stocks. Importantly, again, that was a daily expected return estimate. When we analyze it, we see something arguably more realistic. Why do I say it's realistic? Well, let's compare what this looks like to the actual realized annualized return. So if you pop into the uh, FT, ft.com, 
uh, you can search for a stock quote and it'll tell you the one year change. And at the time of designing these slides, um, Facebook displayed a one year return of 30.17%, uh, which indeed is lower than our, um, our estimates. It's lower than our lowest estimate. But you might say that the expected return on Facebook is somewhere between these two. Um, importantly though, the estimate for the expected return using means or using any other method, for instance, is purely an expectation. It's not necessarily what will uh, happen, right? It's not necessarily what will be realized. For instance, I mean, nowhere in this equation are we looking at uh, Facebook's privacy concerns. And we're not looking at things like the scandals. We're not looking at what happens if Mark Zuckerberg were to die um, or, you know, they have some sort of accounting scandal or a whole host of other firm specific factors that can influence your uh, return on Facebook if you were to invest in them. So it's purely a coincidence that our estimates for the expected returns are this close to uh, what's realized. Right, nevertheless, this is one way of calculating the expected return using means. Uh, an alternative approach is to use what's called moving average uh, expected returns. This is something that technical analysts seem to like quite a lot, and I don't honestly understand why, but we thought we'd include this part just for completeness. For the record, um, I think this is a total and complete waste of time. And, and if you're serious about uh, investing and managing your own portfolios, I certainly wouldn't rely on uh, moving averages to make your decisions. But nevertheless, if you were to do it, this is what you, it would sort of look like. So a 30 day moving average uh, is plotted out here. So all this is, is the average uh, over 30 days. So we're just calculating the average on a rolling basis every 30 days, right? So this is something you would do on uh, Google Sheets or Excel. So that right there is about 30 days. So we literally calculate the average for 30 days. And then you do this uh, every uh, day. And so this is just a moving or rolling um, 30 day average. So if you look at the first uh, observation that we have here for the average uh, moving average expected return, it's from uh, C3, which is the 21st of May, 2012, um, through to the 2nd of August, uh, 2012. Notice that this is 30 trading days. So again, remember that there's 250 trading days on average. Um, so the dates aren't exactly going to line up. Yeah, we're not talking about calendar days. These are trading days. So if you then look at the next observation, we've just gone from uh, the 22nd of May now up until uh, and including the 3rd of August. And so that sort of continues on, right? So if you now look at the last observation, it's just 30 days over here. So we're considering it from the 16th of November, 2017, uh, through to the 29th of December, 2017. So if you were to plot this out, um, uh, let's just get the returns as well as the uh, moving average, then you get the chart that I uh, sort of plotted out more nicely. And so what we're saying over here is that these are the uh, returns we expect uh, and then the blue ones are what actually happened. So as before then, uh, it's not really a good estimate for the reality, right? So these are pure uh, estimates and we know that returns follow a random walk. So it's, it's really pointless and uh, a complete waste of time to try and predict uh, returns using things like this moving day average. I mean, you can literally see that this is nowhere near the reality of the matter. But if we want to look sophisticated and clever, we can do other ways of moving averages. So you can look at what's called a seven day moving average. And you know, some might argue that, ooh, that looks a little better. But uh, in the context of these moving averages versus sort of uh, your normal historic average, the incremental benefits are quite minimal. Uh, and that again is mainly because returns follow a random walk. So you know, if we attempted to try and forecast uh, future returns, here's what it might look like for Facebook. Now, spoiler alert, um, I have done literally no analysis to try and get these two uh, graphs. I literally just drew them, um, you know, to, to try and suggest that it can either go upwards or downwards and no one knows any better. Now, if I was a technical analyst, uh, I might say things like, oh, I mean, there's some sort of resistance or support points and 
other sort of technical jargon that truth be told I mean um, it just doesn't work so um, I wouldn't recommend wasting your time on any of that to demonstrate the impact of uh, random returns I mean these are real studies that have been done um, this is a direct quote taken from the book a random walk down uh, Wall Street uh, and there's plenty of studies that have done this uh, where just randomly throwing darts on say the FT um, and choosing stocks that way uh, in, a, in a sort of well diversified portfolio can outperform uh, or you know do just as well as uh, those that are carefully selected by experts. I really cannot stress the uh, emphasis of returns following a random walk. If there's one thing you take away from this entire course, uh, please let it be at least that. On another note though, perhaps the biggest limitation of the mean-based expected return is the fact that it relies solely on historic data uh, and historic information. So this is really adding salt to injury, right? Because I'm showing you how to calculate this expected return uh, using historic data, yet at the same time I'm telling you that, um, you know, history doesn't predict where the future goes. Um, and so you can think of the expected return, uh, the mean-based expected return measure as a very basic uh, minuscule level of analysis um, that you might consider using. Um, it's taught uh, quite extensively. I mean, this is it, it is used, um, but I would use it with a lot of uh, caution. What we can do uh, are apply relatively more sophisticated methods to estimate the expected return. For instance, we could estimate uh, expected returns using state contingent weighted probabilities or indeed by using asset pricing models. Now, spoiler alert, although these techniques are more sophisticated, it's not the holy grail of finance. There's no one uh, solid method that is you know, the right method, so to speak. For this course though, we're gonna focus on learning these other methods as well, and we'll do that over the next few videos. In summary then, we learned that the easiest way to calculate the expected return on a stock is to compute its historic average return. Notice that the emphasis here is on ease of calculation, not about how good the method is. I certainly wouldn't invest my hard-earned money uh, relying exclusively on this measure of the expected return. Nevertheless, we know that we can calculate the expected return uh, using this formula here. So the expected return on the stock J is equal to one over N multiplied by sigma summation of RJ. In English, all that means is that we're adding up all our observations of daily returns or whatever weekly returns, and then we're dividing it by the number of observations. Put differently, we're just calculating the simple mean or the simple average. Furthermore, we learned that we can analyze the daily uh, average expected returns by uh, two methods, what we call the crude method and the sophisticated method. So in the crude method, you just take the expected uh, daily return and multiply it by 250 uh, trading days. If you've got weekly expected returns, then you would just multiply it by 50 or 52 uh, because that's the number of weeks. And then we've got the sophisticated method, which incorporates the effects of the time value of money. So we compound the daily return, or the daily expected return, um, by taking one plus the expected daily return and raising it to the power of 250 minus one. So this incorporates the time value of money. It compounds the daily expected return. Uh, so it assumes that you will earn this, uh, this same expected return quite consistently every day. And then if that was true, uh, this would be your uh, annualized expected return. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. If any part of this video is not clear, uh, please rewatch it again before moving on any further. That's enough from me for now though. Have a go at the quiz and I'll see you in the next video.